the most important thing to do is to say, I'm there for you. Hi, I'm Lori Creever. Welcome to our interview with New York Times health columnist, Jane Brody. Today we're going to be talking about her book, Jane Brody's Guide to the Great Beyond. As Hamlet would say, talking about the, the mortal coil, mm -hmm. when we're ready to shuffle that mm -hmm. off, let's talk about having something in your advanced directive, even if it makes your palms sweat to consider it, what you want done with your body. Most people would oh. think, oh, I want a, a yeah. casket, but not realizing that could yeah. be six or eight or ten thousand oh, dollars. The, the sticker shock on funerals is really terrifying for a lot of families. And, you know, especially in this economy, we don't want to have to throw all that money into into the dirt. And yeah. that's exactly what happens. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be in your advance directive what you want, but you it would be nice for your family to know how you want your remains dealt with. And for example, my sons have made it absolutely clear to their families, their, to their parents, as well as to their wives and their children when they get old enough that they want to donate their bodies to a medical school. Why? Well, first of all, they're cheapskates. <laughs> That's the least expensive it's the, it's way to go. It's the cheapest way to die. It is really the cheapest way to go. I love it. Um, but also because they care about future generations of medical students. Yeah. And they have friends who are doctors, and they know how important it is for doctors to learn on a real human being. You don't yeah. learn on a dummy. Yeah, true. And so here's the deal. If you donate your body to a medical school, you first of all, you have to do it in advance. You have to say, uh, fill out the forms with the medical school while you're still alive. Okay. Then when you die, the medical school will pick up the body. The students will learn from you. Yes. When they're finished learning from you, the medical school will cremate the remains and return those remains to the to the next of kin or whoever the, the oh, designated survivors. Oh, so your survivors. ashes. So your ultimately ashes. you could have state where you would like your ashes to be spread or Absol saved. Or, or, or saved or what have you. Or that can be up to the, su the survivors as mm -hmm. well as to what they want to do because the ashes don't take up a lot of room. You don't have to bury them. They're not contaminated or in, in any form. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't cost the family a cent. Now, you still may want to have a memorial service, or the family may want to have a memorial sure, service, sure. but it doesn't have to be a formal funeral service with a casket that costs thousands of dollars and a, and all these, you know, all the frou fry that goes along with it. I know, you're it. making me think of all the funerals I've been to over the years yeah. with the embalming and the makeup and the hair and the, you know, you're, mm. it's really not for the person who's passed away. They're right. not there yeah. anymore. Now, you know, this is a very individual thing. And there are families and there are religions where this is what people want and this is how they, they feel comfortable dealing yeah. with, it, with their, with their uh, dead uh, relative. And that's okay if you can afford it. But, you know, how many times when, when families have to scrunt, dig into the meager savings and borrow against the equity on their homes, maybe even sell their car in order to bury a loved one yeah. in this fancy way. Yeah. Uh, there are also, the, in the chapter on funerals, um, there's, a, there's a section on green burials that... Yes, and I want to talk about reef balls. Yes. So green burials. Very, very interesting phenomenon that is spreading now around the country gradually. It's not going to be an overnight thing. Okay. But uh, people are, are increasingly being buried in a green fashion in a nature preserve. Mm -hmm. And they're not embalmed. They're in a decomposing, like decomposable a box. No, oh, in a box. box yeah. It can be in a box. But it, it will decompose in the earth. And mm -hmm. it's truly ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the mm. way the Bible says. Yeah. Um, is this but, a physician that started this? A yes, scientist? it was a physician who started it in, in uh, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And these green burials are gradually emerging in different parts of the country. And it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. Uh, it sounds very restful. It, it's not I mean, only restful, it's I mean, if you knew your loved permanent. one was there, right, it, it just sounds very but peaceful. You are contributing, it just like, you know, no one's allowed to dig up an Indian mound. Yeah. Right? No one can dig up these natural preserves where people are buried. Right. And so you are contributing to the salvation of your environment mm -hmm. as well, um, as well as saving your family some money. 
I like this a lot. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the reef ball. Well, that sounds truly innovative. Yes, it is truly innovative. And, and it is done with the ashes uh, following a cremation where the ashes become part of a living reef. And the reef gets built up in nature and, and becomes the, the habitat for fish and other wildlife that live in the sea. And, you know, life goes on. And I think it's a beautiful way to, to, to end. Yes, I mean, it's so great to have all of this in one place in your yes. book. And yes. so now, what if a person didn't want to do a, a casket funeral mm -hmm. and didn't want to donate their body to science? What about the route of just simply being cremated? What type of a cost difference is that? There's a great cost difference. I think it's about one-third the cost of a, mm -hmm. of a regular funeral. And it varies. I mean, I can't give you numbers exactly because it, it depends on exactly what you want done. Because some people want a viewing before there's a, there's a uh, cremation. And that requires a lot of work by the funeral parlor. And that's expensive. Yeah. So it really depends on what. And I, th I think people should look into this in advance and, and decide what they want and then consult with the family members to see what they want too because mm -hmm. after all they're the ones being left behind right and and some people feel very strongly that they want the whole nine yards of a funeral and if that's what your family wants and you're willing to go along with it then okay and they right, can and afford it right and that's a worthwhile investment yeah. for you if right that's if they can it's afford very it personal. it's important it's very personal yeah but there are there are so many other issues that are so important before we get to the funeral stage mm -hmm. there's the caregiver issues mm -hmm. uh, people who who are caring for their loved ones when they are terminally ill or chronically ill for many years in some cases and I have a chapter on, on the importance and the value of caregiving, but also on the importance and value of, of the caregiver taking care of himself or herself. Yes. Because if that person burns out in the process, they're no good to anybody. True. And right. it's so hard for some people to, to accept the fact that they have a right to take care of themselves when they're supposed to be taking care of their loved one. Yes. It's really difficult for people to do that, and yet it's so very important. I really like that in the book that you do have a nice amount of time spent on the emotional mm -hmm. issues attached. And something I would be curious to know is what about when you find out that someone you're close to has a diagnosis mm -hmm. that they are terminally ill or they have cancer what what do you say you know as a yeah. friend or as a niece how can we support that person and and be respectful but also not um, fueling the denial I mean it's, yeah. it's really tricky it is tricky and and really when you visit a person like this um, the most important thing to do is to say I'm there for you and to mean it yeah. I'm there for you. What, whatever you need me to do, I'd be happy to help you. Um, I'd be happy to have conversations. I'd be happy to be quiet with you if that's what you want. Um, pe many people uh, talk who are in those positions are more comfortable talking to someone a little distant from them than their close relative. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. let's say... Um, a man has had a feud with one of his sons. And, he, and now this man has a terminal illness. He's nearing the end of his life. He would like to reconcile with that son. Yes. And the, the pain of not doing so is not only emotional pain, it's also physical pain. Yeah. And if you can help make that happen, if there's something you can do, talk to that son and oh. say, you know, your dad is really sorry that this came to pass and, and you know now that he is nearing the end of his life he'd really like to make amends and you know so often that happens and it's so beautiful when it does yes. and it's so much more peaceful Peace, people can die in spiritual comfort yes let's talk about hospice mm, very important <laughs> You know, only about half of patients who could benefit from hospice are currently receiving it. And that's really a shame. It's this free care. 
Wow. This is free care. Yeah, I don't think enough people they don't really realize understand that. What they this don't is. understand it and they also wait too long. There are two reasons that this happens, that the wait too long happens. One is that the doctor has to say that this patient is unlikely to live more than six months. Okay. Now, doctors are notorious for giving overly optimistic prognoses. <laughs> God bless them. <laughs> yeah. But it's not fair. It is not fair. Yeah. If you... You need the truth. If yeah. you don't have the truth, then you don't know that it's time to prepare for, for all these things, to get your affairs in order, to say your goodbyes, to, to make your wishes known, to, to take, take your last fishing trip. <laughs> absolutely. To take to do something that you've always wanted to do that you yeah. never got to do. It's really unfair to the person who is terminally ill. So an overly optimistic prognosis is one problem. The other problem is that the patient has to relinquish treatment that is directed at the disease. That doesn't mean you relinquish all treatment. You can get treated for pain, nausea, uh, mouth sores, constipation, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, all that of those addresses your comfort. Comfort level But symptoms. right, you're, you're conceding, essentially, you're no longer going to be actively using medical treatment to fight the disease. That's correct. I see, okay. And so both of those conditions are necessary uh, for you to enter hospice. And that's one reason, th those, are the, those are the two main reasons people wait too long. Mm -hmm. they, they say, oh, you know, I'm waiting for a miracle. I, 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 well, you know, wonderful. Miracles don't really happen, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, people may improve. I mean, if, if you feel that the doctor has not given you a fair shot at treatment, you're entitled to get a second opinion and sure. even a third opinion. Yeah. I mean, maybe there is something out there that will keep you going for six more months or a year or even two years. Mm -hmm. It won't happen indefinitely. Eventually, this disease will get you. But in the meantime, you may want to explore those options. But once you have explored those options and you know what the truth is, then hospice is a joy for most it's people. It's a great option. Well. It is a great book. It's really a compendium of wisdom. There's cartoons. There's mm -hmm. a bit of levity to make it easier on our palate. Right. I thank you for writing it, and thank you for coming in thank to talk you, with Lori. us. My pleasure. This is Lori Creever signing off, inviting you to read a book. It could change your life. And let's encourage our children to do the same. Thank you. You can find additional books by Jane Brody at bookstores and your public library. Titles include The New York Times Guide to Alternative Health, a Consumer Reference, Jane Brody's Good Food Gourmet, Jane Brody's Good Seafood Book, and Jane Brody's Good Food Book.